Okay, well, welcome everyone uh, to what looks like a, a very interesting uh, afternoon workshop on interpretations of risks in contemporary Southeast Asia. Uh, a very uh, relevant topic, of course, in the age we're living in uh, right now. Uh, the uh, presentations are all from uh, students uh, from France studying uh, for their uh, PhDs, working in Indonesia, Thailand, and uh, Vietnam, and all of whom have an affiliation with uh, IRASEC. Uh, we're hoping later on to hear from the uh, director of uh, IRASEC, uh, but he seems is unable to be with us right now. Uh, so I'd like to uh, just start straight away on the presentations. The way we're organizing it this afternoon is uh, to have some quite short presentations, uh, 15 to 20 minutes each, uh, followed by a few specific questions. Uh, but we want to leave plenty of time at the end for comparative discussion. Uh, to me anyway, one of the really interesting things about this afternoon's uh, session is that it, it involves researchers coming from many different disciplines and with seemingly quite disparate topics. And yet at the same time, uh, they've managed to bring these uh, together across disciplines, across the countries and across the very different topics on which they're working uh, and bind them together uh, through this theme of risk and uncertainty, which on the one hand is a, you know, it's, a very, it's quite a universal uh, theme and one that's in, COVID times is perhaps more relevant even than it's ever been. And yet at the same time, uh, risk and uncertainty is quite culturally specific and time specific. So I'm looking forward to uh, each individual presentation, but also uh, looking at what sorts of uh, common uh, questions and themes uh, might arise. Uh, we are going to, going to take the uh, presentations in alphabetical order by uh, surname. So without further ado, I'd, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, invite uh, uh, Mr. Tanawat Prima, uh, who is uh, with Agro Paris Tech uh, IAD, uh, in, uh, in Paris, but is currently speaking to us from uh, Bangkok. So over to you, uh, Tanawat. Thank you very much, uh, Phil, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen. OK. Is everyone seeing the PowerPoint? Can I get a confirmation? Yes, yes, we, we can see it fine. OK, very nice. Uh, although right now we, we are seeing it in presenter view uh, instead, oh. of, instead of in the uh, main view. Mm -hmm. OK, maybe I can share my the other screen. OK. Like this. That's, that's better, good. right? That's good, okay. yes. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, the RCSD and the ERASEC for organizing this uh, uh, graduate seminar. I'm Tanawat Bremar. Uh, I work with the IRD in a research center focused on uh, water uh, management, users, and actors. Uh, myself, I, I come from a sociological background. So when I look at the uh, issues of uh, whether it's policy framing or knowledge uh, pr production, I will look at how the, the, the interrelation between actors and how that translates into uh, decision making. <clears throat> so just to touch on a quick note on the why I chose the, the issue of uh, sinking Bangkok and the threat of submergence. It's because when we look at the, how uh, groundwater induced land subsidence in Bangkok has been treated in the literature. We mostly find uh, writings coming from the some technical backgrounds and mostly from engineers from the fields of geology and hydrogeology. But we lack a critical uh, review of 
the the five uh, the five decades of uh, policy making around the issue of land sub subsidence. So just to put simply, when I started the research, I just asked myself, what is land subsidence? How is it linked to groundwater governance? And how is knowledge uh, on the topic produced? And that eventually led me to formulate a more uh, academic review of how the interplay between knowledge production and policy ad advocacy shapes the uh, understanding of how we project uh, the reality of what subsidence is. And to, in order to understand this, we, we must also pay attention to where, when, and by whom is uh, this course or any text, anything that is said about land subsidence, uh, where is, are those uh, discourses realized? <clears throat> so in order to, for the purpose of keeping it short, I will simplify the presentation by focusing on the concept of storyline as developed by Martin Hayer in his writings on discourse coalition and discursive analysis. So the storyline I want to look at is um, when I started working on the issue of land subsidence in Bangkok, when I went to see a lot of um, uh, multiple governmental agencies, what I've been hearing a lot is that Bangkok is not dealing with subsidence anymore. And luckily for us, our predecessors recognized the problem early on and implemented measures so that we, are, we don't have to move capitals like Jakarta or we did it better than Jakarta. So this is something I've heard from multiple agencies. And as tempted as I was to just accept this statement and go look for another issue to work on, I was still intrigued by how the threat of submergence uh, remains a hot topic in the media, despite the experts claim that subsidence is now a non-issue for Bangkok. So when I talk about submergence, I mean both the sinking city and the threat of sea level rising. <clears throat> So when we want to look at this storyline, we must first understand that a storyline refers to a, a statement that summarizes uh, a complex narratives. Because usually when you, we're in a public forum or during a press conference, uh, the people speaking do not, not necessarily have time to explain a, a whole 300 page report on a, such an issue. So they will, uh, they will mostly uh, exercise their discourse using condensed statements. So there are multiple storylines that uh, revolve around the issue of subsidence, which we will analyze today, such as the one that uh, says that now it is uh, reduced, it's only limited to one centimeter per year. <clears throat> and storylines are uh, first and foremost mediums through which actors can impose their view on, uh, of reality on others. So there are ways of correcting bias, trying to change the point of view of uh, alternative uh, discourses. So it is most importantly a, a set of meaning and realities that emerge through the interaction of multiple actors and institutions. So a storyline um, gets generated on a problem only after the, the problem is, uh, is identified. So that's what uh, we refer to as uh, problem framing. The issue of subsidence has become the problem uh, in 1968, when a researcher from the AIT, Richard Cox, uh, made a report on the, the issue. So just to quickly explain uh, how land subsidence works, so we can uh, move the conversation forward. Uh, when we talk about land subsidence, we mean the fact that the uh, the, the, level, the level of the land is reducing with the passing years. And this happens a lot in the deltas because deltas are a challenge, challenging environment for city development. The young delta soy is uh, composed of unconsolidated uh, uncons uh, and semi-consolidated sediments, which is prone to compaction. So on the image on, on the left, you could see uh, it's a, a sort of abstract representation of um, how the underground layers are, uh, um, well, how the underground soil is layered be beneath the, uh, the clay uh, under Bangkok. 
So we have uh, layers of sand and layers of clay, and the layers of sand also carry water. And if you pump too much water, you reduce the, the pressure of this water, and the, eventually the layers of uh, clay will compact and get close to each other, and then uh, that's what we call uh, inelastic compaction. It's uh, it's permanent compaction because you can't uh, water can't seep anymore into these uh, porous layer, and the subsidence becomes a, a long term uh, threat. <clears throat> so for the Bangkok Delta, this is especially a, a problem, just as it is in uh, Ho Chi Minh, Jakarta, and even so, some other cities such as uh, Tokyo and Mexico City. But for the case of Bangkok, uh, when we look at groundwater pumpage, it started in the 1950s. The earliest recorded public pumping was in 1954. And gradually from the 60s onwards, the private pumping uh, outgrew the, the, the public pumping by, uh, by the year around 1974, 75, as you can see in the summarized table. And what came after the, the recognition of the problem was uh, two decades of concentrated policy efforts. So the policy efforts focused uh, on zoning crisis zones to establish our policy priorities. And it consisted also in phasing out of groundwater by developing the tap water distribution in the 1990s. And the la latest, uh, the last implementation measure was to uh, use a pricing policy to start uh, levying tax on groundwater between 1985 and 2006. So here are some images of uh, when land subsidence, uh, what we have to understand also about land subsidence is that it's not an immediate problem. For example, you, you pump a lot of groundwater, but the, the effects will be delayed. So before it is rendered visible, a lot of time will pass and it is only much later that you will realize that you have a, these sort of problem. <clears throat> so uh, this is a table that uh, captures a bit of the evolution of the pricing policies. Here you can see uh, how the, uh, land, land, uh, the issue of land subsidence actually was the origin uh, that prompted the government to make a groundwater act and start regulate, regulating the, the usage of groundwater. So it was amended twice, uh, the Groundwater Act, to, uh, to better account for the expansion of the problem of land subsidence. So once in 1983 and another time in 1985, uh, 95. And later as, um, uh, as the, as the implementations were, as the policies were implemented, from 2003 onwards, the the concerns around subsidence started uh, disappearing as a growing narrative of the success story emerged. First uh, deployed by the World Bank in 2008, that uh, commended the efficacy of the pricing measures, and then by the Department of Groundwater Resource, which said that it is now it has now become a non-issue. So in order for this course to gain traction and credibility, it must be sustained by a, substantiated by an epistemic community. And when we look at a, an epistemic community, <clears throat> uh, it actually refers to a network of uh, experts within a certain domain that can claim authority to advance uh, this course in a, uh, in a policy domain in order to facilitate decision making. So a lot of actors are, are in, were involved in the issue of land subsidence and groundwater pumping in Bangkok. I've just highlighted here in, uh, in black the main ones that were uh, the main producers of knowledge. So in blue, you have some uh, academic uh, actors such as Kaset uh, Saad University, Chuarongkorn University, the Asian Institute of Technology. Uh, so these were all worked on the uh, issue of land compaction with the aid of JICA in 1995. 
And the other two principal pillars of the knowledge production is uh, the Department of Groundwater Resource at the center and the Royal Thai Survey Department. Uh, so the Royal Thai Survey did some leveling, which looked at absolute subsidence, while the Department of Groundwater Resource looked at how, uh, look at the usage rate of a groundwater resource. <clears throat> so from the very start, these, uh, these, these three uh, group of actors uh, rose to prominence as uh, the experts on this topic. And when we talk about uh, expertise and authority in terms of uh, uh, a discourse coalition, the way a discourse becomes dominant is when uh, such actors find a way to impose their view of reality on other actors and that they become authoritative enough to suggest certain social positions and practices as being the best uh, choice for decision making. So there were multiple instances when, where officers from the Department of Groundwater Resource during uh, the interviews I have conducted with them, where they have claimed that they, uh, they have corrected the viewpoint of other university experts or they have informed other people that, uh, that were speaking wrongly about the land subsidence. When I try to handle the, the issue, the, the controversy around uh, the state of subsidence, uh, I, I would be uh, I would be met with some uh, some answers that uh, sometimes uh, some expert from the Department of Groundwater Resource would say that oh the Chualongkorn report is uh, actually wrong. I have already contacted that professor and uh, enlightened him on the true uh, situation. So with the passing years, what I have seen is uh, the Department of Groundwater that really rose to take this. Uh, uh, take uh, the leadership in knowledge production on this issue and be the one that imposes uh, its view on others. And <clears throat> there were multiple, um, uh, there were multiple policy directions that uh, could have been taken when we were looking at how, how, uh, how, how we can pump the groundwater sustainably through the imposition of a sust sustainable yield. So multiple ideas that have been floated is the, uh, for example, the, the idea of uh, artificial groundwater recharge. This was proposed uh, in the 1990s, then rejected by the Ministry of Science and Technology, which I've highlighted uh, in, in red here. There was also the idea to relocate industrial, uh, uh, industrial sites outside of Bangkok or the more simple idea of develop, developing the public tap water so that uh, we can switch from groundwater to surface water. <clears throat> and lastly, the idea that uh, conquered the other ones uh, was demand management through uh, pricing policies. So this was done in 1999 when the, the government of Chuan Big Pai uh, decided that uh, it would be too costly to conduct uh, the artificial groundwater recharge, and so they prefer to do uh, to choose the demand management uh, option. And slowly, we've seen uh, from from contesting views, we've now seen all the actors gather around a, uh, a sort of middle ground coalition. So it was a co coalition that uh, argued for reasonable groundwater usage. And the main uh, idea behind this uh, coalition, the main belief is that uh, groundwater is a valuable resource. It should not be wasted uh, by not using it. It is absurd to completely ban, uh, ban its usage because some types of industries rely on the quality of groundwater, which surface water cannot provide. And uh, lastly, it was also advanced in this uh, coalition that groundwater should always remain an option in case of extreme drought events. So we can't let uh, the people die of thirst, or we can't just uh, choose not to use groundwater if we really lack surface water. So these were the, the main beliefs that accompany this uh, middle ground co coalition. And in order for the storyline to become dominant, so uh, um, as I've said, uh, there needs to be some uh, scientific community that rise to prominence. But some other discourses and other alternative issues also need to be sidelined. 
So I'll be picking some, some of them here just to illustrate uh, some of the points, but I'm willing to discuss it uh, in more detail if you, if you want after the presentation. So one, uh, one of the facts that have been sidelined in this uh, success story narrative is the externalities produced by the policy focus on Bangkok. When we zoned Bangkok as the main area to implement the policies, uh, groundwater usage uh, actually rose uh, quite a lot in Samut Bagan and then later in Samut Sakon and Nakhon Batom provinces. <clears throat> and uh, to, to this idea that uh, now the, the subsidence is not happening in Bangkok, but in the surrounding provinces, uh, to this idea, usually I met with answers such as Bangkok is only sinking at a rate of uh, one centimeter per year nowadays. Uh, so it is an acceptable rate for uh, uh, metropolitan cities by international standards, according to the city planning department. So everybody will cite this uh, figure uh, without, uh, up to this date, I still haven't found the empirical claim as to why uh, one centimeter is uh, more acceptable than any other rate. And another uh, also quite uh, powerful uh, verb, uh, quite powerful statements that I've been hearing is there are no high rises in Samut Sakon uh, province, so subsidence doesn't pose as much of a problem there as it does in Bangkok. So it's not an immediate uh, threat yet, and we can just let the pumping continue on as it is. And uh, lastly, for the case of Samut Prakan, uh, which is at the southeast of uh, Bangkok uh, on the coast. <clears throat> So some city planning departments and groundwater department, they've been saying that the subsidence in Samuprakan is now only due to na natural clay compaction. So there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, even though there are st still some illegal pumping happening uh, around the industrial estates, uh, as confirmed by, by interrogating uh, uh, local officials uh, in, in Samuprakan. Another problem is the uncertainties that are sidelined when making uh, models or making calculations. So sometimes when we deal with subsidence, um, agencies will draw contour maps. But to really have a great picture of uh, what is happening, you need to have uh, an immeasurable number of uh, groundwater wells, which is not permitted with the current uh, budget policy and budget line. And um, <clears throat> Well, uh, the answer I've been getting a lot from the Department of Groundwater Resources is that ideally they would like to expand the monitoring network. But now, since the issue has been resolved in inner Bangkok, the policy focus of the department is now on groundwater uh, pollution, on groundwater resource development for the dry season agriculture. But nobody is uh, pushing for uh, developing the monitoring network anymore. So. Uh, one of the statements I've been hearing is also that working on subsidence nowadays doesn't uh, warrant you a promotion in the department. So there's no incentive for anyone to work on subsidence anymore. <clears throat> and lastly, a uh, quite interesting one is that um, subsidence uh, in Bangkok is actually a two speed uh, matter. There was an immediate threat for Bangkok, but then there was there is also the a more long-term threat. Because even if we say that it's just one centimeter per year in Bangkok and maybe three or four in Samut uh, and three to five in Samut Sakon, if you add these up uh, for the next 20 or 30 years, it will still increase a vulnerable, uh, it will still make Bangkok more vulnerable to future floods. And the answers I've been getting to this uh, problematic fact is that um, climate change is still too uncertain for any decisions to, for any governmental agencies to commit to uh, any uh, infrastructural measures uh, at the moment. And another really quite uh, strong uh, statement is that uh, we can engineer our way out of this during public meetings. Uh, the, the engineers from a uh, University or Kasetsad University assured the Department of Groundwater and the City Planning Department that if it is ever necessary, there are some remedial structural measures that can be implemented. 
So three of them uh, consist in raising the dikes or using the roads as dikes for as coastal dikes. Or the most uh, shocking and ambitious one is the one where I've put an illustration for that is actually closing the Thai Gulf. So these ideas have been floated uh, for quite a, a number of times as something that we can do later in 30 years, should we ever need to. Um, to wrap up this uh, understanding around the, how the storyline uh, on, uh, on groundwater usage and subsidence emerged, uh, I just want to highlight the fact that uh, the, the narrative of a success story in groundwater uh, demand management uh, allowed the, uh, the business to carry as usual in provinces such as Samut Sakon and Samut Prakan and Nakhon Batom. And uh, it also sparked a declining attention to the shifting zones of subsidence. And even the narrative of uh, the success story itself, it can still be questioned because um, uh, the groundwater usage continue to increase expo exponentially, even after the implementations of the pricing measures, it, uh, it increased to a peak in 1997, just before the Asian financial crisis. So in my own opinion, I, uh, I would like to counter the, the claim to the, uh, uh, the successful management by the, uh, the governmental agencies by saying that they can't really take credit for the declining groundwater usage rate, because I believe that it happened because from a conjunction of uh, multiple factors, such as the Asian crisis, there was the uh, release of the Factory Act, which uh, promoted the disindustrialization of Bangkok. So a lot of industries moved outside of Bangkok and the Ministry of Industries, uh, people within the Ministry of Industries confirmed to me that this wasn't done with subsidence in mind, but rather with the idea to make uh, Bangkok less industrial. <clears throat> so it's uh, rather a conjecture of uh, multiple factors that led to this uh, decreasing risk for Bangkok, but uh, that's at the price of the externalities. And while what I would like to really highlight is that while the immediate risk for Bangkok has been handled, uh, there is still some policy attention that needs to be sustained on the long-term risks that can impact the Bangkok uh, Delta. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to hear the other presentations. Does anyone have any questions? Please feel free to uh, ask questions either using the chat box or simply raise your hand. We're not a very large group today, so feel free to raise your hand using a Zoom uh, facility and, and I'll invite you to speak. But uh, thank you very much, Sanawat, uh, for an excellent presentation. Uh, very interesting to uh, hear not only the, I guess, the sort of prevailing storyline, but also the effect that the storyline has had in terms of taking the policy attention away from the issue of uh, subsidence. Um, so we'll, we've got time for uh, two or three uh, questions if people would like to ask about the, the problem or simply about uh, subsidence in Bangkok. Okay, so we have one question from uh, Irene Chuan to everyone. Um, how much uh, actual scientific research has been done on the issue of subsidence? Uh, so over and above the uh, government departments you've talked to and the engineers at Tula and so on, how much uh, work has there been uh, done on the ground? Um, well, the first uh, comprehensive uh, investigation on the issue of land subsidence and groundwater pumping was done between 1978 and 1981. So that was a, a joint um, effort from the, uh, let me come back to this. Yeah, from the National Environmental Board, which contracted the, uh, the, the Thai military through the Royal Thai Survey Department, the Department of Groundwater and the AIT to do the, this research. Then the, the Department of Groundwater has been 
uh, keeping some monitoring. At first it was monthly, but nowadays they just do it uh, twice per year, uh, a leveling. And the issue with uh, the research done by the Department of Groundwater is that sometimes there, there's been a lot of turnover uh, between 2003 and uh, the current uh, staff at the department. So most people nowadays haven't carried on the, the research uh, that were started uh, prior to, to their generation. And some of us observation wells have been damaged uh, and others have, uh, they have got uh, re restriction to access. But uh, if you're asking about other parties, uh, there's been some help from international, uh, 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 yeah, from other national universities such as Kyoto, uh, some Israeli experts also came to provide some feedback on the issue of land subsidence in Bangkok. But um, with the decline in attention in the recent years, uh, the latest research that we have actually is uh, uh, using INSAR technology. So it's satellite Im imagery to try to project a, be a better estimate of uh, land subsidence instead of using the traditional leveling method. Mm. Thank, 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 thank you, what a comprehensive answer. Um, Ashley South has asked, uh, how much subs uh, subsidence is there in Bangkok to, in, in comparison with other capital uh, cities? And he said that he missed the start of your talk. Uh, so you said a bit about that, but maybe you could give us some sort of comparative uh, reference there. Uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> What is important to keep in mind is that um, not all the cities started uh, acting on land subsidence at the same time. Um, I would say that the, the, the first pioneer would uh, really have to be Japan, which uh, detected uh, issues of land subsidence in around uh, 1905. They started researching in 1912, but then due to the First World War, they didn't carry on any research for another 20 or 25 years. But uh, they've handled uh, the issue of subsidence in uh, uh, Tokyo for really well. So they've been dealt. Uh, it's been it's been dealt with uh, by the uh, yeah sixties, seventies. Uh, uh, whereas in Thailand, when when I say that today it is only one centimeter per year, it's supposed to uh, a really critical rate back in the eighties and nineties when in Ramkhamhang. That's the most decided uh, figure. The subsidence was 10 centimeters per year. Mm -hmm. So that was the highest rate. And um, other cities, I don't, I'm not sure if I have the current numbers, but uh, Mexico City at one point was three to five centimeters. Uh, in California, it's also been handled uh, uh, quite well, but at one point it was five to seven, depending on the zones. But even Bangkok, when we say one, uh, I've seen some recent uh, INSAR image that suggests that uh, some areas of Bangkok are still subsiding three to four centimeters. So it's really not easy to give a number that covers the whole city. Mm. And I don't recommend we do it. <laughs> Thanks. I've got one uh, question, and perhaps we'll make this the last, the last question for your talk, uh, Tanawat. Yeah. And that is, when, when this was being discussed in the 80s and 90s, uh, the issue of sea level rise associated with climate change was talked about, but it wasn't really thought as thought of as happening then and you know then and there. It's very different now. Right now, uh, people talk about uh, actual climate change, actual uh, sea level rise, and even though we're probably talking in the order of something like two or three millimeters per year compared to these, what maybe three or four centimeters a year you mentioned just now. I wonder to what extent does this get the, the relevant agencies off the hook? To what extent does this also allow them to say, well, you know, we're not concerned now with subsidence, we're concerned with sea level rise. So how, how much does climate change discourse uh, shape the uh, way of avoiding the problem? That's a, that's a very, uh, I really appreciate your, your comment because that's a, actually quite an important topic in how the discourse and the, the storyline is uh, being constructed. Because uh, actually, uh, as you've mentioned, a lot of governmental uh, agencies uh, 
mostly ex experts within the universities, but that work in uh, partnership with the uh, Department of Groundwater. They advance this idea that um, now the threat of submergence is being uh, naturalized. Uh, if you're shifting the attention away from uh, what we can do about groundwater usage, just to say that now it's the climate that's changing mm. and it's a global effort, um, there's not anything that uh, we can do if, uh, as Bangkok dwellers or you just shift away the attention from a human made in, uh, risk to a sort of uh, all pervading uh, natural risk that everyone is uncertain about. And uh, the idea that I also find quite disturbing uh, when we when people tend to shift the attention to sea level rise is that sea level rise in uh, in Thailand, uh, especially in the Thai Gulf, is a bit uh, higher than the global average because uh, we have warmer waters and we have to look at the global currents. So in in the Thai Gulf, it's four millimeters per per year actually projected for the next uh, twenty to thirty years as opposed to a global average of around two, depending on the region. But uh, when you put four millimeters next to the subsidence that happens in centimeters, uh, it really begs to question why we are not uh, putting much more attention on uh, the uh, immediacy of uh, subsidence when sea level rise is uh, happening in, yeah, in the order of millimeters and people just use it as a sort of uh, yeah, idea to hide behind and <laughs> maintain a policy in action. That's uh, the way right. I view it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. We actually have two more questions that have come in. I think I might take the first one. This is a very, very <laughs> last question. And there, there will be time at the end, I hope, to come back to other, other questions. So Irene, sorry not, for not taking your second question. But Antonia uh, Moore has uh, asked, uh, what the situation is in different sub-districts because Bangkok is pretty big and the level of subsidence is, is you know, different in different parts of Bangkok. Uh, so to what extent uh, uh, have you looked at the more specific environmental conditions that contribute to the problem in, in different parts of the city? Um, so what we have to understand is the subsidence through groundwater usage will follow the, the main groundwater users, which in the history of the expansion of Bangkok, uh, where mostly the, um, uh, the development of a ho housing estate. So in Thai, that's what we call the Muban Chatsan. So it's a residential communities. And uh, the other big users are the industries. So if we look at how this uh, um, becomes territorial, territorialized in, Bang uh, in Bangkok, uh, we will see a sort of geography where uh, land subsidence uh, get, uh, tends to be concentrated in districts such in the east, such as Nong Chok, uh, Minburi, Lat Krabang. So these were uh, estates where once the roads were developed and industrial estates uh, started appearing with many residential communities. Uh, when the expansion rate outgrew the, the rate of uh, tap water, the delivery, that's where the, the, the burden of groundwater usage uh, happened a lot. So that's a quite an easy way to look at it, but the other one would be to look at more recent uh, works with INSAR and uh, yeah, through satellite Im imagery, you can uh, see more the subsidence that is due to building load. So we'll see a bit of this in Saton, Yanawa, near the river. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tano. It's a great, uh, great start. Um, I see that uh, Jerome Samuel, who is the director of uh, IRASIC, has now joined us. Um, I wonder, Jerome, would you like to say a few words? We were uh, hoping to hear from you at the beginning, but perhaps there was a connection problem. Uh, but I think we can, uh, we can jump in now. So if you'd like to say a few words now. Yes, you... thank you, Philip. Uh, first of all, I must apologize for my this uh, late uh, uh, coming in and taking uh, part into this uh, this this meeting. Uh, I had uh, connection difficulties in, in Paris, unfortunately. Anyway, uh, I will be very short. I just want to um, uh, to to thank and to say that uh, we do at Irasek what I, where I'm replacing uh, uh, Claire Tran for the next two or three years. Very grateful to all the parts which were involved in the organization of this uh, this meeting, 
and this this uh, short symposium, and especially um, uh, institutional parts of CSD, uh, Professor Cheyenne, and uh, of course Alexandre, who was the uh, actually was the main organizer of uh, of the meeting. I would like to thank all the the participants for giving their time and their insights to uh, to to speak about, to discuss, and to think about all of these um, environmental problems, which are very important. The first importance uh, in Thailand and in other countries of Southeast Asia, including Indonesia. I'm more familiar with Indonesia than with Thailand, and. I, as a, um, a social linguist, is more. I'm I'm more in, uh, familiar with other problems and problems which are discussed today. But anyway, uh, the topics is very interesting, and uh, I'm very happy to see uh, so many people gathering here today. And I just uh, uh, want to finish by wishing to you uh, fruitful. Uh, discussions and uh, uh, exchanges all along this afternoon in Bangkok or in Thailand and in France for those who are in France or uh, in Europe uh, today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jerome, and, and also, of course, uh, to uh, your organization, IRASEC, for uh, your support for this research and for bringing the students together. I should also uh, say thank you to Ajahn Chayan Watanaputi and to RCSD. Uh, for uh, co-hosting uh, this uh, this seminar here in in Chiang Mai, um, I wonder, in fact, whether a sociolinguistic is entirely irrelevant, given that we're talking about discourse and the role of language in society. Is uh, uh, maybe it's uh, we said at the beginning that this is a fascinating seminar because it brings together so many different disciplines around uh, this common theme of risk and. Uh, uncertainty and language is is also uh, I think part of that as we heard uh, partly from the first presentation. We now we have uh, two more presentations in the next uh, hour and uh, a bit. Uh, as it happens, I see the first three were from uh, from students at various institutes in Paris, and the last two are from the south of France. Uh, so I'd like to. Uh, invite uh, Alexandre uh, Marin, who's uh, currently working on issues of uncertainty and risk in a more, I guess, more from a more cultural perspective in Nan in Northern Thailand. Alexandre. Yes. Uh, well, good afternoon to all. Thank you for the introduction. I will try to share my screen with you. Do you have it? it? Yes, thank you. Yes. Well, uh, well, my name is Alexandre Marouen. I'm a French PhD student in social anthropology in the University of Montpellier. And my research is about how a village community in uh, Nan province in the north of Thailand receives and deals with uh, threats and uncertainties. Um, uh, the main method of my research is ethnography, and I'm currently uh, doing field work uh, in a village of the Nan province uh, since February of this year. And uh, for today's seminar, I've decided to focus on uh, one part of my findings, uh, uh, that is to say how uh, religious uh, interpretations and and means are involved uh, in dealing with uncertainties and natural threats. Um, I would like first to start with a few uh, precision of what I mean by uncertainties and natural threats. Well, mostly those are um, related to a local climate or the local environment, or uh, what one might call um, universal misfortune, uh, misfortunes that are inherent to human life, such as disease, accidents, uh, suffering, uh, grieving, etc. And that is to say that uh, for most cases, the threats that I will talk about are not directly, directly the result 
of society's organization. Uh, and those are all old threads that are intertwined with uh, the local culture. And as such, they are um, dealt with uh, th thanks to cultural means. And uh, one, one important me cultural mean is religious means um, that um, promote, uh, if we were to summarize it, uh, a mix of acceptance and protection. Uh, and protection. Um, to describe briefly, briefly the the local religion, it's um, is a syncretism of Buddhism and of uh, animistic beliefs, uh, and um, these two elements are integrated and form a religious system that is very specific of Northern Thai culture. And uh, the argument uh, that I would like to defend today is to say that uh, these uh, religious, the, the concepts, beliefs, and rituals of this religious system um, play a, an important role as to how uncertainties and natural threats are uh, understood, interpreted, and uh, dealt with by the villagers. Well, uh, firstly, um, the Buddhism, the Buddhist doctrine or Dharma as a whole preaches uh, acceptance and equanimity in the face of of, um, uh, of misfortune. And um, it emphasizes, the doctrine emphasizes how suffering uh, are, is inherent to human life, how diseases, death, natural threats are things that humans uh, cannot manage, cannot predict, and they, but no matter what, they will have to face uh, them they will be affected by those threats. And as such, it encourages people to uh, accept them and live with them. And uh, this, this logic of acceptance is um, encouraged by uh, the concept of karma, which I'm sure you all are familiar with, which is the belief that what happens to one is the result of one's previous actions. And as such, it's um, one could say that it's a fatalistic explanation of of events, but it does not doesn't mean necessarily that they won't do anything about uh, the event in question. And uh, against misfortune, when faced with misfortunes, they will try firstly to acquire merit through good actions, but also to seek protection from sacred beings or things such as monks, but also supernatural beings that, that are um, based on animistic beliefs. And um, these animistic beliefs are based on the, the belief that, that uh, nature is inhabited, inhabited by a vast array of of uh, supernatural beings, spirits both malevolent and benevolent, gods and goddesses, uh, angels, etc. And uh, those beings are believed to be able to mediate between human and nature. And as such, people will go to, to them to ask for protection, but they will also uh, the, the, the presence of these beings of, offer them a way to explain and to give a meaning to uh, misfortunes that in and of itself are, are absurd. And uh, as such, they will organize uh, rituals uh, that take the form mostly of uh, negotiations with the being in question uh, with vows of offerings, and um, they will. Uh, these rituals are both um, made uh, in prevention, so before any misfortune takes place, but also 
whenever the misfortune is interpreted as being the result of a, a punishment from the supernatural being, they will make a repair ritual to, to, to ease the, the, the wrath of the being. Um, well, I would like for you to, to give a few examples of uh, ceremonies, including those supernatural beings. The first one that I want to mention, yes, uh, is um, a ceremony where they pay homage to the guardian spirit of uh, the river spring, uh, which is called Stelwang Passat. And it's um, this, uh, the river, uh, it's a river that runs across several villages uh, and as such, the ritual concerns several villages. Uh, and uh, during uh, this ritual that is organized in uh, the end of April, so just before the beginning of the rainy seasons, they will go to the shrine that you can see here in the middle of the forest and make uh, offerings and uh, prayers to, uh, to the spirit. And um, they will, in the prayers, they will explicitly ask the, for the help of the spirits, of the spirit against uh, water, any water related issue, such as uh, lack of rain, drought, uh, in general, uh, floods, or any damage to the irrigation network, local irrigation network. Um, one other example that I would like to describe is uh, the ceremony where they pay homage to the guardian spirits of the temple. Uh, there are two of them, the Taupu Wat uh, here and the Taupu Ka over there. And um, uh, this is also a, a ceremony that is done preventively where people will gather during the Thai New Year uh, including uh, a monk, as you can see here, and a lay religious expert that is right there. And they will, uh, in the prayers, uh, they will ask uh, again for the protection of the village against any type of danger. And for example, this year they asked the protection for the protection against uh, COVID-19 pandemia. Um, one, one last um, ceremony that I want to say a few words about uh, is, a, is a ceremony that is called Su Kwan Ritual, which is organized for an individual. And it's a ceremony that consists in calling back the Kwan, which is the vital energy into the body, because this vital energy is believed to be uh, likely to be to have a tendency to, to flee from the body, which cause disease and misfortune of any kind. And as such, there are rituals, uh, rituals uh, both uh, organized preventively at uh, whenever, um, at like, at an important, important steps of one's life. So marriage, death of a relative, etc. But also as repair, repair rituals, whenever uh, the misfortune has been interpreted as being due to the Quan getting away from the body. Um, just here are a few other pictures, a few pictures of other ceremonies. So here is the Sepshita ceremony, which is a household level type of ceremony where the members of the family gather under these three pillars and monks are invited, as you can see. And uh, it's also, again, to seek protection uh, for the members of the family. Yet another ceremony here is the Songkran ceremony, which is done during Songkran, and whose goal is to expel the, any danger, any evil from away from the village. Finally, you have some, some shrines of the spirit of the places, uh, which are spirits that you can find in the fields, but also at homes and in, in the forest or plantations. And uh, it is believed that if, uh, uh, and if people forget to, do, to pay offerings to them, misfortune can affect them. Um, 
where I could give many other examples, but all of them follow uh, the same pattern, that is to uh, look for help from sacred beings or things. And um, what do these religious beliefs tell us uh, about the local interpretation of threats? Well, I think it tells us that um, uncertainties and natural threats are not to be managed. On the contrary, um, it is implied that it's impossible for humans to, to control, to have absolute control, and that some events, no matter what, will stay out of grasp of human power. Uh, and as such, they will try, because it's impossible for humans, they will try to, to seek for protection from supernatural beings, which are believed to be able to influence those natural forces, natural threats. But uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the spirit in question does not uh, grant them their, their wish all the time, which means that the, the uncertainty is not erased, but it, it uh, offers them with a way to give an explanation, to give a cause to something that normally they are powerless, against which they are powerless normally. And as such, they offer them spirit, spiritual means as to how uh, through, through rituals and through respect uh, to, as to how um, repair the damage, so to say. Um, as uh, as to, to finish up my, my presentation, uh, even though since the beginning, I, I stated how much important, how important the religious interpretations are, and they are still relevant today. In my opinion, they are uh, endangered as well as the local culture as a whole due to effects of modernity and development. And um, some of these effects are, can already be observed. It's the fact that some religious interpretations or, or, or rituals have already disappeared. Uh, in the past, they would, for example, um, organize the, the Sukwan ceremony that I mentioned before for buffaloes or, or, or rice as well, because those are believed to have one as well. And um, they would organize this ritual, notably when rice would get a disease, for example. But due to technological change in agriculture, the use of tractor, the use of chemicals to deal with disease, these rituals have completely, completely disappeared from the village and maybe in the, st the span of two decades at most. And uh, not only that, but even the rituals that are still done today are weakening in a sense. Uh, it's the example, it's the case for the shrine, the shrine, the spirit of the place, rituals related to spirits of the places where the number of shrines have greatly decreased over the years as to, according to the villages, because people um, um, do not uh, practice these rituals and do not uh, present offerings to the spirits, which are, be are believed to have uh, fled away, have gone away. It's also um, in the case of the, um, uh, the guardian spirit of the river spring, which is believed to be less powerful than, than before and also less willing to, to help them uh, because of uh, the bad behavior of people. And for some villages, it is due also to the destruction of the forest near the shrine. Here on the picture, it's, it's not, uh, uh, we cannot see it, but uh, very next to the shrine, they have planted rubber trees instead of the forest, the natural forest there. And uh, also uh, it's the fact that this ritual that before was organized by all the villages of the different villages concerned is nowadays, though it's nowadays, nowadays only organized by the local administration, the sub-district administration. And 
and as such they believe that the the spirit has is no longer able to uh, has has decided to punish them a bit and will no longer help them and a lot of people do not believe that he's able to help them anymore but more importantly also i think that if we look at uh, what's going to happen in the near future and when we look at who are the ones making the the rituals who are the ones taking the initiatives who are the ones like that know how to organize them well then it's mostly old people people that are 60 65 years and older and I, I would like to invite you to take a look at the pictures where you will see that uh, there is no young people and it's very rare to see young people under 40 present in 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 these ceremonies and uh, here for example here yet again it's mostly old people 70 70 years and older here again here there is one kid but so really i i'm i'm wondering wondering will will these religious interpretations survive when this generation which is also the last generation of peasants, for example, will die. Do, do the, the, the younger people have the time, the faith and belief and the knowledge to be able to mobilize these religious uh, interpretations? And uh, when we look at uh, the reason as to why young people are no longer there, well, it's mostly a lack of time because in the modern conditions of life where there is a need, ever increasing need for cash, well, young people are mostly um, are, like, are busy with, with, with work and usually elsewhere from the village and not in agriculture as well, which means that they do not have time for village life and activities, nor do, do they have any interaction with the local environment, or is very way less than than in the past, for example. But it's also let's face it, a, a lack of uh, of transmission and of interest from the, the the younger generations. So of course it's only a tendency. Of what I'm I'm talking about here, and things can change. But uh, in my opinion, in the direct in the direction where these local society is going, it's highly likely that these uh, religious means and cultural means to face, uh, that they use to face uncertainties and, and, um, and natural threats will, will slowly but surely uh, fade away. Uh, but that will be it for me. Thank you for listening to me. If you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. So again, please feel free to uh, post your questions in the uh, chat box or to raise your hand, either way is okay. While we're waiting for questions to come in, I've got one more conceptual question for you, Alexandra. Both in your title uh, and your abstract, and indeed in your presentation, you talked about uh, what's natural and what's supernatural. But I wonder to what extent is this distinction that we tend to make in a more sort of Western academic, scientific, modernist uh, way between the human, the natural and the supernatural, how relevant is this distinction in the context in which you're working? Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, of course. Like, uh, I guess uh, I use the term supernatural because it's the term that uh, in English we would, we would use but it's not necessarily appropriate uh, as to what, uh, uh, as to the, the local um, perceptions of things, because in my opinion, for them, uh, these supernatural beings are not supernatural, but they're very natural. Uh, they, are, they are parts of nature and uh, of the environment, which is both, uh, like uh, inhabited by spirits as well as animals as vast array of, of beings so yes of course uh, it's maybe a bad a choice of terms yeah thanks i mean it's a, it's a kind of interesting methodological question which comes back also at least to clara's presentation 
where Clara talk, <coughs> talked about the way in which we may frame things as environmental for the people affected. There is not really that distinction between what's environmental and what sort of economic through a livelihood uh, basis when livelihood is dependent on uh, the natural surroundings and so on. So I think the categories are are important and, and it's the way in which uh, you, we talk about them uh, is also relevant. We have a question from uh, Irene, uh, Irene John, um, who asks, it would be interesting to place, sorry, interesting to explore ways to stress the relevance of these practices and belief systems in the face of development forces and the rising threat of catastrophic misfortunes. Have you noticed anything of uh, of that extent in your ethnographic work? Well, thank, thank you for this question. Uh, in locally, uh, there is no catastrophic catastrophic misfortune that has happened in uh, in in the, the people's memory nor in the the recent past. But um, it is true that uh, uh, not only uh, development. Uh, and modernity and endures the application of religious interpretations for what I call uncertainties and natural threats. But uh, development will bring about new uh, type of threats and risks that are mainly economic uh, and uh, social related and also environment, environmental due to pollution, etc where in this case, it seems that the religious interpretations are not so much uh, mobilized, uh, especially against economic risk and against uh, these, these, these type of threats. They, they are mostly either powerless because they do not have any cultural mean because those are new type of risk and the, lo the culture does not, did not, the local culture did not, uh, uh, encompass a uh, way to deal with them, but it's also, uh, so they will mainly uh, deal with those risks through strat individualistic strategies uh, of, uh, yes. so yes, it, it's true that the relevance of uh, religious interpretation in some case will be still uh, there, the case of health related disease, that could be, for example, due to chemicals or et cetera. They will sometimes use religious interpretations, but mostly they will not use them when, when talking about risk related to development or social economic changes. Mm. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Well, I wonder if I could ask one other question while we wait to see if anybody else would like to uh, chime in. Uh, oh, we do have one actually from, in fact, from the next presenter, from uh, Juliet, who asks, uh, what is the discourse of young people on, on their own ritual in the face of modernity? Are we not losing the religious, religious dimension in favor of a patrimonial dimension? Well, uh, it's interesting that if we look at the discourse of young people on their own uh, ritual, the, see, if we talk about the young people that are between 20, 40, they still know of the ritual. They still know about how, what, what uh, all the, these beings, supernatural or natural, whatever they be, uh, and they still know a bit of uh, the existence at least and they will still some of them uh, uh, mobilize such such uh, religious interpretations notably the the, the 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 beings that are the most uh, important one uh, such as uh, metorani the, the goddess of the soil or the monks the buddhism uh, uh, sacred uh, beings but um um it's true that most of the time they will not mobilize it and it's more something that yes, it's, it's there, but they themselves will not actively use them. So it's more like something from a, a cultural, cultural thing that they do not use anymore. And it, it is becoming more something like, yes, a patrimonial uh, uh, 
treasure that needs to be uh, needs to be like uh, respected, but because of this, it's no longer alive a bit uh, in 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 very very way. It's more like a, a folklore, so to say. And for example, in the the ceremony of the uh, guardian spirit of the river spring that I mentioned, nowadays it's it's, it's done by the employees of the local sub-district administration, which are mostly young, but so they go there, but it's, uh, it, it seems that for them, it's more like a, a, a pretext to uh, an occasion of communication, to communicate through images about the rituals and not necessarily um, uh, believing in it or truly believing in it. Mm -hmm. All right. I wonder whether I might just play devil's advocate a bit and uh, challenge you on the, the rather linear <coughs> uh, uh, way in which you're, you're talking about this disappearance of uh, ritual or in answer to Juliet's question, uh, the sort of change of function to a more kind of museumified folklore, folklore instead of uh, belief. And that is, uh, if we sort of look beyond what's happening in this village and locally to a wider societal level, you know, a puzzle that's much discussed in Thailand is how as the country has moved in, into a sort of more modern and urban and educative way of life, uh, the influence of uh, various beings, whether we call them natural or supernatural, and the practice, for example, of bon, of to, to go and ask for offering, ask for uh, uh, favors and, and to, to promise to support this charismatic monk or Buddha image and so on. I mean, this is as strong as, as, as ever, and people put it down to uncertainty and people's uh, uh, insecurity and so on. But it, what, however you explain it, it's clearly not taking a linear direction. If anything, this is you know, stronger than ever. So I wonder in that context, whether you see this as a sort of linear disappearance of the re religious nature of ritual or whether you see it as changing in its, in its geography, in its form and function, in its uh, you know, being, being less localized. I, 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 are, you, are you situating your study within this kind of wider discussion of uh, of belief systems in in Thailand, well, uh, not necessarily, but uh, it is true. But I think, but uh, as I said, they seem to be um, an economy uh, that they make towards uh, these various beings, with the most important, the most powerful ones being still able to 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 be relevant, and the the the, the more local ones such as spirits of the place that are disappearing. Uh, and so, and, and it's true that uh, except for charismatic monks, for example, these are still uh, strongly believed. So it seems that uh, there is a hierarchy in these uh, various beings and uh, the, the ones that are disappearing, disappearing right now, in my opinion, are the the, the local and inferior ones, and the, the superior one is still relevant, of course. But um, it's nonetheless it's true that uh, what's happening now, in my opinion, is something very new. Uh, the fact that uh, no the the absence of young people in rituals uh, is something uh, very new. Uh, it's not like it's, it was always old people but we're taking the initiatives of making these, these things because when you talk with the old people of the village now, they say that when they were young, they would go to these rituals. So both young and, and, mm. and old people. So of course it's never linear, but uh, there is linear, but there is um, a rupture that in my opinion has, has happened and we cannot uh, um, forget it. Good. <laughs> Excuse me. Good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alexandra. Um, we'll move on now to uh, the final presentation, uh, which is uh, from Juliet uh, Sindra and 
is looking at COVID-19 and tourism in a village in Java. So Juliette, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. So I will try to share my screen. It's okay? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, although, although, sorry, you might want to maximize <laughs> it. Right now, we only see part of your screen. We don't see the whole. Uh, yeah. It hasn't been maximized. So, so thank you. Yeah, I'm Juliet from Ex Marseille University, and normally I'm focused on transmission system, the link is to be with uh, natural environment or the structure of social space uh, linked to the rural change or sustainable development. So today I will focus about the situation of uncertainty and the risk. So this is a quite new perspective for me. So thank you, Alexandre, to give me this opportunity and the URSEC. So, um, uh, yeah, the, the situation of uncertainty faced by the younger generation in two villages of the Middle region, so uh, it means the southeast uh, mountain in Javanese. So these two villages are not very far from each other, but their contexts are very different. One recently subject to the, econ the entry of economic markets, and the other um, more uh, far from this logic and uh, remains dominated by rather traditional agricultural lifestyles. So in order to understand the situation of these two villages, first I will just focus on the general context of this region, the Konokido region, which also allow me to highlight the application of the last economic development policy. So this region, it's um, on the southern part of the city of Jagjagartha, uh, this is the largest region of Jakarta with the lowest population density, and until now, this region has a character of periphery, only accessible, and this is especially true for the Dada Bayou village, um, quite rigorous agricultural lifestyle, but we will come back after with uh, the presentation of the village of Dada Bayou. So, just in 2010, the, with the geopark movement launched by the states and the recognition by UNESCO in 2012, the Indonesian government has taken this advantage of this natural potential who become now a uh, territorial resource to boost tourism in order to fight against the local economic recession and the rural exodus. So at this moment, tourism become the main vector for the modernization of the village and is now the trust strategic sector uh, for this region, has uh, illustrates this uh, sentence uh, objective of the institutional uh, institution of the region, making Gonokidil a leading force seeking cultivated tourism. Um, so, this is with a particular orientation of policy, and of course, there is a lot of disparity between the village in this region, depending of the uh, classification of the natural resource on heritage or not. So I was I want to start by the discussion on Nokosigi Tamlet to understand what kind of uncertainty uh, can uh, improve the younger generation and to understand also why taking place this kind of politic and also uh, what happened in the Bejarjo village and why the tourists become so invested. So first the Nokosigi if I can, okay. Uh, no, no crossing it, Hamlet. So this is a data by your village because of course in Indonesia, the village are so big. This is 8,000 people spread over 20 hamlets. So my study it was focused just on one hamlet, the no crossing it, Hamlet. Um, this village also typical uh, of the South, region of Konokidul. This is the middle of the geopark in the cast area. And uh, the hamlets are actually located in the depression area between the cast hill and connected to each other by little paths. 
So this is typical Java nest virality with an agricultural way of life, temporary concentrated by the agricultural cycle and ritual with the relation system of neighborhood and family very dense. So just a few points about the rigorous agricultural lifestyle in this village from which some uncertainty situation emerged. First, there is not rice cultivation. There is, uh, this is mainly cassava, maize, now has a palawija. So this is just one or two harvests per year. Why not rice cultivation? Because this part of Switzerland is north to lakes, surface water and low fertility due to its particular geology. So also the daily needs for the village, uh, what the daily needs of water depend now just on the rainfall. And there is some consequences uh, from the green revolution, but especially from the Swato era. Before there used to be two lakes, central ones that given fertility ritual. Today they have been drained by the construction of the green water pumping station a few kilometers away since uh, maybe the final era, 18th, 18th, yeah. Uh, which supplies half of the region and it starts with running water. So as a result, mark and gardening has become scarce. Not mechanization of the agriculture use or they used to uh, use chemical inputs, sometimes modified varieties with technique more intensive, but above all agricultural technique based on a yield, thus there is a disappearance of diversity of the crops, the old variety, particularly one of them that is not cultivated now. This is a rice which is now sought after for its very low water recruitment. Uh, this is one of the examples. And even if this is mostly substantive farming, the eggs is normally sold on the market, and this is mainly cassava. But despite the recognition of its better nutrition, cassava flour, its name Tirol in this region, is not longer the staple food and has been replaced by rice, which is bought every day for the villager. And have to know that cassava is 10 times cheaper per kilo than the white rice. So um, even if they start to create a, a sector through culinary tourism, but uh, this is not significant benefits for the farmers who sometimes prefer to not sell it at all. So the most active part of them uh, practice a double activity or already uh, work all sides. Because now, if uh, before there is some uh, system, autonomy of system, uh, economics and now the needs increase and the first needs is schooling and in this context the younger generation now of course more schooling uh, increasingly more uh, to the modern lifestyle and for them it's very represent the situation of facility for their future it's really not easy for them so from the point of view of this second and especially the older generation, the feeling of worsening of lifestyle, it's not so much due to the lengthening of the dry season and the shortening of the rainy season because they are very uh, improved also the climate change, but in this part of this region, of the karst region, in this village of the south of Konokidul, they have developed advanced techniques to cope with the water shortage. And so in the head, they are, uh, how to say, maybe better adapt uh, to the, this kind of climate change in comparison to all the village or the north of this region. So the feeling of the aggravation of the way of life, its uncertainty for the future of the village is structuring around the impact of the old agricultural development policy and also because uh, they feel there, there is not too much support to find another solution to have a trendy, trendy so re revalorization of agricultural. And of course, for uh, the second and the third generation, it's because the younger have a defection of uh, the farming and the small scale industry. So there is no worker who will use the land and after who will continue the ritual into this activity and who will continue to live in the village. So this is this risk how expressed um, 
and it expressed the concept of the social cohesion and social reproduction. So, in fact, the younger more and more go to school to get the final exam and to go in the fabric. This is necessary to go in the fabric. So, in the city, sometimes they continue to live in the village, but most of them leave the village. And from the point of view of the village leader or even the younger generation, this is a feeling of being neglected by development policy today compared to the other village in the region, which have a road access and an economic boom with an increase of living standards and new employment opportunity. But um, in spite of the, this discourse, this prevailing discourse in the village, we observe a strong involvement of the younger generation uh, present in this village or returning in this village when they, uh, when they go back from the city. So first, the one hand, they reinvest the money inside the village. In the other hand, they participate through their local organization, the Garantaruna, in the artistic and ritual activity as we can see there. This is uh, in this picture, this is young people of this village who come out to watch over the dead for a week every night. Um, so in fact, the young people in the Javanese rurality have different roles, uh, which contribute to their social, political integration and uh, well, the economic one, it's uh, start to be difficult for them. So normally they energize the village by organizing, for example, sport activity with the surrounding village. They are the main vector actually of the relation established with the outside world, whether in terms of territory belonging between the, the other hamlets or economic activity or of also security. And this is a case on this picture. This is security. Uh, they maintain security and uh, in the border of invisible world. So, uh, well, they are several in the younger uh, and in the in the village and um, the uncertainty about the future. Unlike in the village, the establishment of tourist eco situation so different, and this is just near. <laughs> yeah. So the tourism was developed around the Pindle Cave, and at the beginning, this is an initiative of the regional government, uh, and this activity was soon taken over by the villager at the local level. The two operators are managed locally and they were based on the village organization and especially on the village youth organization, the Karantaruna, to give institutional legitimacy and local insurance. Uh, actually, at the beginning, the village invested in the activity where so they chose an organization based on marriage, the social political structure of the social space is village, the authority uh, is uh, come from the elder generation of the second uh, generation, uh, the village leader. So the young people in this moment uh, take care of the parking, the exterior, the guiding of the village executive and the elder generation have the authority managed to the head of the two operators. But what happened in the village is that the influx of tourism and the enthusiasm for the new tourist activity grows. There was a multiplication of the touristic operator. There is one operator to 12 operators, all from the village. And um, I will not too much going in the detail about the multiplication and the conflictual context on this village uh, because it's too long. So just the two points. First, the tourism and the touristic operator have set up on and around the place of worship and natural that have a primary importance for the villager. 
So, uh, of course, there are uh, several regimes of legitimation that intervene for the in exploitation of the cave. And uh, the second, it's like there is no, in the beginning, anticipation uh, when the states and the other institutional, um, uh, yeah, the institution regional introduce tourism uh, about the enthusiastic of the villager. So, there is no clear re regulation. Uh, about the management of the commons area from the point of view of the customary law, for example, because we are dealing with a place that are the part of the village which are topographies that we can see on the map. Uh, in yellow, in orange, actually, this is the first operator, and yellow, this is the other operator. And normally, uh, follow the cave that's uh, marked in red. Uh, there is a kind of topography ritual. Uh, this is linked with the belonging of the hamlets, and of course, at each point uh, from, to the river, uh, there is ritual practice, knowledge, linked to the Javanese cosmology. And uh, the second, when happened the tourism, there is also now uh, study for capacity uh, regulation of the capacity shares of the Pindu cave. So this operator now in this village become the main uh, source of employment and give a new opportunity for professionalization of the younger in the village. That's are the same of Nongo Singit. If they return to the village, they do not come back to the other activity inside the village as a farming or uh, agriculture. agriculture. So actually uh, what happened is the majority of young people in order to boost tourism and because now with the 12 operator we are in a competition of uh, context competition they create a new alliance with the outside world for tourist operator or their own activity we see for example young people associating with a certain number of uh, intermediary like taxi company agency all the guides from the city or encourage outside investment with the bank notably so, for example, in this picture, this is a, a big share bank give a formation uh, to the workers in one of uh, the operator to help increase the income from the tourism. And uh, that we see, uh, this is the younger participate, the other really do not care. Uh, so, <clears throat> this situation uh, played the village much more firmly within the new socio-economic good contingency of development. So we start to have different logic of action in this village. One specific to the representation of the village social space with the integrated system of value, and the other drawing more from an external system of meaning, economical, political, and also religious, that is more and more considered, especially for the exploitation of the cave. To be simple, uh, they give work, uh, have a lot of tourism, do money, continue to exploit the cave or dead. Uh, in this process, the organization of the younger increases place in the decision making and political space of the village to the point of sometimes hosting the second and the third generation at the head of the certain touristic operator. Uh, until sometime, the organization of the younger because they attach to uh, the one hamlet or belonging of territorial uh, disappear in the profit of just individual action or some group uh, uh, not linked with the territory entity. So if, of course, tourism is a good opportunity to increase the standard of life, limit the rural exodus, contribute to school education, and access to the conception, and uh, diversify the economy of the village, in this context, the sure investment now of tourism and the relational system, the relational system of proximity are totally repurposed around this new activity. Um, the operator have now become a privileged place of sociability and collective meeting. Uh, sometimes the family or different. So we have a competitive um, this situation leads to a phenomenon of over tourism. Yeah. So in this picture, this is a entrance of the Bindle Cave, and uh, sometimes we do not see the water uh, 
of the river because of tourism tried to get into the cave. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, this contributes to the deterioration of the ecosystem of the cave and the Grand River, uh, the geopark in general, and the new risk emerged in relation of this environment and, of course, the social cohesion of the village. Uh, so, what future for that village? And, of course, in this context, there is all the discourse that we do not accept this kind of form of development, even this is development from villager. Um, they point in uh, lack of interest in local knowledge, novel, the touristic use of the sacred place that could be also emerge new risk with, uh, kind of interpretation also of some recession and the poor management of the flow touristic. As a result, the lack of a guarantee of the sustainability of tourist activity. It's the risk associated with the loss of the village autonomy and the failure to maintain, for example, the dual activity. Um, this is uh, this kind of discourse, even some practice uh, come from the older generation, but sometimes also from the young people and even sometimes from the leader operator or uh, sometimes the states try to, to, to do a regulation so this is a really complex situation and actually the question is just a question of structuration of the relational system or the collective action and uh, finally uh, this situation uh, reveals the needs the, the new context economy reveals the needs for these young people to express their own mode of action and with the new risk emerged in Bidjar Jure, the question of facilitating national or transnational investment to repress tourist activity and land privatization process that orient some development projects in this region, especially in relation to the commons, and uh, face it of the non cosigate situation and the uncertainty that improved the younger generation. The second question that arises is that of the privileged investment in the tourist activity of regional policy. Subsidies from regional institutions actually exist to develop the village. Economical logic of return of invest contribute also to orient, orient all the action around tourism or profitable economy. And that is not all the time adapted to the local reality. But of course, with the pandemic situation, uh, the situation starts to change and uh, the situation between Dada Payu village and Bidjo Abjo turn over. The student stop of this activity, of the tourism activity, uh, put the young people in a dead hand. And uh, we see the continuity of the social space and the local response faced of the risk and uncertainty situation. So this is really nuancing the economic change within the local economy and to put in front also the capacity of action and some continuity. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Juliet. Uh, so, uh, very nicely contextualized uh, account of how uh, these new opportunities come with, also with new uncertainties and, and, and particularly the place of young people. Uh, in them. Uh, we have uh, altogether just under 15 minutes before we need to wrap up. Uh, so uh, to start with, uh, I'd like to invite uh, questions specifically for Juliet, but then we can also open up to the wider panel and uh, uh, welcome observations on overlapping themes between the presentations as well as comments for individual presenters. Uh, but to start with, do uh, other other questions uh, either through the chat box or simply raise your hand for Juliet? I guess while we're waiting, I might ask one one question just about the current situation with COVID nineteen. I mean, is this seen by young people and by people more generally as a temporary interruption? Or has it got people kind of rethinking this um, this solution to livelihood 
uh, and thinking maybe it's too risky? Actually, in the COVID situation, because I was in the theater, I was trying to rethinking. Even if sometimes uh, we have a kind of disco of the younger, uh, this is just a disco, and they do uh, just nothing because they are in the situation of tourism, and all the temporary are focused on tourism. And with the COVID nineteen pandemic, all the deterioration, social deterioration, and the old tactic, because they do not come back to the city to work, so they start to work. Uh, point of view, and even that I can give maybe some example. Uh, they start to follow, uh, ask the solution to the older generation that they do not live a virtual way. And sometimes they around the hamlet to uh, have another activity, but linked with the relational, uh, uh, yeah, the social and relational system of the hamlet, and not. Uh, Thank you. Uh, are there other questions or comments uh, for Juliet from the participants? If not, then please feel free to pose your question to uh, anyone, any of our five speakers, uh, or even in more general terms for anyone to uh, to answer. Uh, so the question from Alexander is uh, for Juliet is uh, how do the elderly see the changes brought by tourism? Depending on the, on the elder, but uh, for them, the, 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 they are not, they are okay with tourism, but this is the form that take tourism in this village. And uh, for example, there is some elders that are in charge of ritual. When they see the use of the sacred place just for the parking of uh, booths or just uh, all the younger people have to send to ritual to give protection or to have more tourism, or um, they were thinking, uh, because this is all the time also the discourse of the younger, uh, of the elder generation, the younger lose our knowledge, the younger lose how uh, philosophy and identity. So uh, this is a kind of um, position of the elder people. Tourism okay, but uh, with the regulation and uh, with the respect for the sacred place, for example, uh, because they're singing the, the younger do not afraid anymore about the invisible world, but give another risk for the cohesion of the social and the village. This kind of discourse that cannot happen. It cannot happen. Maybe uh, I could ask a general question and uh, any or all of you can feel free to answer that. You know, one of the uh, issues that came up from right at the beginning of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, was this discussion of a new normal. Maybe uh, this is an opportunity as well as a challenge uh, to think about uh, ways in which uh, we can not just go back to what we used to do, but to go forward in a way that where we've learned our, our lessons. <clears throat> so thinking about all the uncertainties associated with COVID-19, but maybe some of the other uncertainties, uh, do any of you have a sense in which the people you're working with, the people you're interviewing or spending your time living amongst are actively talking or thinking about uh, livelihoods and movement and existence in, in new ways as a result of the risks and uncertainties that they're, they're facing? I can, I can answer, I think, uh, for my part. Well, um, at least where I'm staying, it's the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is really seen mostly through uh, the, the consequences it, have, it has on the, the local economy, uh, which is the fact that uh, most of the villagers uh, have uh, a major part of them 
really their income uh, thanks to um, uh, small daily jobs, employments, and uh, from local uh, businesses, stuff like that. And with the, the pandemic, I, there, there has been an employment. And so for them, uh, I don't think they have uh, started rethinking uh, this dependency of the local economy on, on external actors, but uh, not really, they're just hoping that it will go back to, to how it was. At least that's the present situation for me in, in my case. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. Any, any others? Uh, who won the West Point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, actually, well, in, in the village where I, I was in, uh, during the COVID pandemic, and yeah, they started to missing in the boat. Uh, what could be happen? Uh, but it's take a time, actually, uh, because uh, in the beginning they was just thinking this is just one month, and, okay, mm. everything will, will be okay now. But when happened the first pandemic, they see uh, they totally were thinking uh, the touristic activity also, and how we have to do a double activity if we want to continue, of course, uh, you know, to live in the village, and the second also. Uh, this is a destruction of our environment because they go back to fishing in the river. They go back to have a some activity linked with the natural aspect, and they see the the destruction of our environment. So uh, yes, there is some reflection, and of course, uh, what happened? This is a, a discourse that uh, the resistance discourse that was invisibility totally during the uh, touristic activity now uh, are put on in the front of the social scene inside the village and have more legitimacy. Uh, so uh, given other space of discussion that uh, do not have uh, before. Hmm. Okay, well, before we finish, are, are there any sort of wrap up comments that uh, any of you would like to, to make? Anything that's been talked about in the discussion? You'd like to reflect on further. If not, uh, I'd like to thank all all of you and Alexander in particular for putting together this uh, very interesting session. Um, I guess you're at various stages of writing up your PhD thesis, some earlier, some uh, more advanced. Uh, but I wish you well with uh, the remainder of your. Uh, PhD programs and 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 hope you uh, manage to stay in touch with each other at least through uh, your ethic. Um, uh, you've you've uh, put together, I think, a very interesting and useful uh, set of presentations, and I look forward to seeing it on, uh, I guess, on YouTube or on the sites of ERSEC and RCST. Uh, Alexander, I think you're going to uh, capture the recording and make it available through both institutions. Is that correct? Yes, yes, right. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much and uh, stay well, stay safe wherever you are. Uh, and we'll, we'll conclude the seminar uh, right here. So thank you all very much.